Hi, I'm Doug, and on behalf of everyone at Worship Musician Magazine, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this deep dive on DPA microphones and accessories. Down below in the show notes, you're going to find timeline links for all the categories, overviews, microphone and accessory demos, as well as interviews with Kim Walker Smith from Jesus Culture, Luke Anderson from Elevation Worship, as well as Chris Griffin, Jason Coburn, and Luke Vogel from Church of the Highlands. Five tips when buying a microphone with a couple of quick caveats. Number one, not everybody who plays at church just plays at church, and that works for a number of the AV techs that I've had a chance to work alongside with at church. So that is to say, if you're watching this video and have nothing to do with the house of worship, there's going to be a ton of great content because I'm going to make some specific suggestions about microphones and accessories for specific applications, as well as some tips on how to get the most out of them. Now, speaking of getting the most out of the microphones, down below in the main overview, I talk about two very important things that are very pertinent to the house of worship. One, the most common microphone-borne problems that we have to deal with week in, week out. And number two, the things that worship teams do that prevent our sound teams from making the most out of the investment that we make in the microphones themselves. With that said, the five things. Number one, clarity. We want a microphone that can accurately capture the sound source, such that when we pull up that fader on the mixer or we go to bring it up in post, it sounds like the original source, so we do not have to mess with it or like video folks like to say, sweeten it after the fact. Number two, ease of use. We depend on volunteers week in, week out. So these microphones should be easy to set up. And again, it's not rocket science when you got a great sounding microphone that accurately captures the sound source, which gets us to number three, blend. We spend a lot of time in rehearsal getting musicians to blend together. So if you've got an accurate sounding microphone that's placed in the right place, when you start to bring up faders on the console, they should automatically blend well. And that, again, is the magic of accurate sounding microphones that are placed in the right location. That gets us to number four, visually unobtrusive. Over here, we've got the 4097 micro shotgun. That's also known as a plant mic and the MMA A audio interface. And so say, for example, you're doing some sort of interview and you don't have anybody there to hold a boom for you. Well, this guy can be easily placed on a tabletop and then you can just kind of hide it like that and no one's going to know that it's there, but the fidelity is super high, which gets us to the last thing, flexibility. There are a number of mainstream artists that you may not necessarily know use DPA microphones. Carrie Underwood, Metallica, Green Day, and Sting, who uses DPA in the studio and on stage. As a matter of fact, his stage form factor is the same that Kim Walker Smith uses. That is the de facto. Now, in the studio, one of his go-to vocal mics is the 4011A. 4011 refers to the capsule, and A refers to the preamp. So that's a little bit DPA lingo there for you. So here's the deal. Flexibility is huge. So the same microphone that Sting uses in the studio on his voice, we're going to use on a bass amp in the bass amp demo. That is the epitome of flexibility. Again, something that Sting would use in the studio, we're going to use on a completely different instrument on stage. Huge amount of flexibility. So with that said, let's get to the content. The following interviews with some of our favorite people from the House of Worship do a great job of telling the story of what DPA mics deliver on the platform, slash on stage, front of house, online via broadcast media, and in post. And Luke Anderson from Elevation Worship really sums up the nuance these mics deliver. I remember the first time hearing DPA mics, uh, it was I, 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 it was like my jaw dropped and I almost couldn't even fathom that there were mics like this on the market, but I had never heard of them, never played them, <laughs> and it was as if I didn't have ears in anymore. So we're going to kick things off with Kim Walker Smith, who has one of the most amazing and recognizable voices in modern worship. Kim, thanks so much for joining us. Why don't we start with where you first heard about DPA mics? Uh, it was actually my front of house guy who told me about it. Um, his name is Daniel Ellis, and he's been doing front of house for me for, I don't know, over a decade. So he said, hey, let's just test it out. He got one for us just to borrow for a, just for a test run, and I loved it. So we bought it and kept it, and here we are. So what did you get from these mics that you weren't getting from the other mics you were using before? The biggest thing is that it catches all of the very subtle differences in your voice and tone and inflection. So 
what I have found with um, microphones I've used previously, it kind of sounds a little flat in that it's just kind of like a, I don't know, a, a wall of sound with your voice coming back at you. But with the de facto, I can hear kind of the different inflections and different tones um, of my voice as I'm singing. And, you know, when I'm singing, I don't sing just uh, one, you know, one tone or, or just one volume the whole time. So I really appreciate being able to hear all the, the different kind of elements of my voice. So you have a ginormous voice. <laughs> So not only do you have this great range in terms of pitch, but you also have a very, very wide dynamic range. Can you tell us about how these mics enable you to better capture all of that? When I first used it, it was out on a tour. I just decided just to, to jump out and just let's just go for it and see how it does. And um, it was on my on my side tour. And I remember, you know, some of the songs, the range, it gets really soft and really low and then jumps up huge into a big bridge. Um, it jumps up an octave. And I noticed that when I got really soft in my voice or I sang really low, it was still coming through loud and clear. And I could hear all of the, the subtle notes. Um, and, and then when I jumped up really big, it didn't feel like it was just like, blowing my eardrums out either. You know, it just, it is somehow, you know, some sort of genius of a microphone. <laughs> uh, it captures all of those, that different range and um, makes it just come through really clear. Is there anything about the de facto that really stands out to you the most? Well, here, here's another thing. This is why it's really important, you know, when, in churches when we all made the switch to using in-ears instead of the floor wedges. Um when you have a, a floor wedge, um, you have a lot of sound coming at you. And for a singer, it's very easy to over sing because you're trying to hear yourself above all of the instruments, all of the things coming through the floor wedge, not to mention you're on a stage surrounded by all the instruments and hearing all of that. So it's much easier to kind of wear your voice out and to, to over sing in those times um, when you don't really need to be singing. Because that's the other thing. You got your front of house person who's controlling the volume of your voice out in the crowd. But you don't really think about that in the moment when you're singing and you're trying to hear yourself. So we switch to in-ears so that we can hear our voices um, really clear and not over sing. We can hear our voices above all the other instruments. So similar with this microphone, I think that it's a good uh, long-term investment for singers because you can hear, as I said, all of those subtle differences, the low end, the high end. And again, I think it helps you not over sing. And so it's much better for your voice over time and for longevity, I think, um, with with also not over singing. The other thing is that when you over sing, um, you tend to lose control of your pitch a little bit more. So I think that's another thing that that will help. Of course, that, that microphone doesn't have that kind of magic. It's not going to correct your pitch for you, <laughs> um, but it's. I think it's going to help you not over sing, which again that helps you with your 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 control and your pitch. Some sound techs like to have the vocalist place the mic right at their lip so they can control the dynamic range from the board, where other vocalists like to actually have the ability to use the microphone more like an instrument. How do you use the de facto? I do move it. Part of that might be out of habit. And part of that is just um, as I'm listening to my voice and what I want to hear coming through uh, in my own ears. I'm very, I, I trust Daniel. I trust what he's doing out there. So I just leave it up to him to figure it out and do what he needs to do out there. And I do what I need to do for my ears. <laughs> and so um, I get up closer on the mic when I'm singing softer and, and I uh, pull usually to the side just a little bit when I'm singing some really big loud notes. That was the other thing I noticed about the DPA when I would just slightly turn my head to the side um, and pull back just a little bit. It didn't sound like my voice just disappeared. It again captured it really well. I've also noticed, and I don't know if this is just in my head or if this really is the genius of the microphone. Um, but you know, if you're standing right in front of the other instruments, sometimes there's some bleed into the microphone. I don't notice that as much with the, with the DPA. Um, I I notice that when I'm there and singing on it, it it's it's like it's honed in on my voice. And there is always, if you're especially if you're close to the instrument, there's always going to be some bleed. But I do not notice it nearly as much with this microphone as I have with with past microphones I've used. Kim, this has been great. Thanks again for making time. Is there anything else you'd like to add? 
love the de facto. It's awesome. Drummer Luke Anderson is best known for his work with Elevation Worship. But like many musicians I know, he doesn't just play at church. And DPA microphones have become an integral part of his process, both at Elevation Worship and in his home studio. So let's find out why. I remember the very day I was at a summer camp and I remember spending so much time in this cafeteria with all this rackety reverb and it just sounded so echoey and I was tuning the drum so much and I remember I felt like an idiot once I realized this but I was like oh my gosh man like the microphones and the PA and the sound guy and that all affects so greatly how my drums are perceived and it it was kind of frustrating because then it's like no matter how much I wanted something to come across a certain way or have the effect in a room like that change the atmosphere in a certain way you know if the, the, the sound guy wanted to put a massive gate on my floor tom then it's like it limited me to all the emotion and dynamic that I wanted to play with and I almost felt like well, what's the point of even practicing with all this dynamic and sensitivity and small little t touch and thought that goes into all this stuff if ultimately if you have a terrible microphone that can't even really distinguish that stuff and pick it up then what's the point you know and as you get older you start to you know you learn how to have the right conversations and you learn how to prove yourself and build trust with people to where you know i mean one of our sound guys kent margraves he like i'll, I'll be like whoa i hear tiniest gate and he's like oh, that must have been someone like that used the board last and he pulls all the gates off my drums and or puts them on just so lightly so the second the drums are activated they come through and I remember the first time hearing DPA mics. Uh, it was I, I, I. It was like my jaw dropped, and I almost couldn't even fathom that there were mics like this on the market. But I had never heard of them, never played them, <laughs> and it was as if I didn't have ears in anymore. And all of a sudden, everything I'm doing on the drum, good or bad, now is being picked up and. Uh, you know, interpreted out into the room through the PA exactly what I did. It can pick up everything that's amazing dynamic wise that you're doing and trying to perceive it or playing with a mallet. It can pick up the mutedness of it so delicately. And I remember just like seeing these tiny little mics and being like, is that, that's going to pick up the depth of floor tom or rack tom or whatever else. And uh, yeah, I had a, I had to have a, my own set when I had my first experience with them and recording at home has been one of the best things with being able to, to pull out those sounds that you're wishing you could pull out in your head and with these microphones I feel like I can't anything that I want to grasp out of the drum set and you know and then it's like we put all this thought into the wood and the type of rim and the head and to me like so much of that stuff was lost in the miking process and getting to PA that it was almost like why are we putting so much thought into it if it's not really even creating the impact that we want it to and I've just never felt so adequately represented until I've got you know I love the overheads they just make my cymbals sound like butter you know just smooth butter they're present they're not crisp like I remember putting overheads on and feeling like they were already EQ'd exactly how I'd want the cymbals to be they weren't shrill or harsh and uh, I couldn't be more pumped you know to be a an artist representing a company like that but uh, more pumped to just even have have the ability to be able to use them so last year I flew down to Alabama and met up with Paul Andrews from DPA. We got a chance to watch Church of the Highlands capture their annual Christmas extravaganza. In fact, that recording is just about to come out now. So from that perspective, I wanted them to share their thoughts about utilizing DPA mics in a giant production, as well as things as straightforward as where they would suggest starting in the DPA line. Hey guys, great to see you again. 
Why don't we start off with your roles and responsibilities, kicking it off with you, Chris. Hey, Doug, it's great to be with you today. My name is Chris Griffin. I'm the creative worship director here at the church. My job is leading a team of really talented musicians, and we put on the music conferences, events. We also do the original music uh, from the church. My name is Luke Vogel, and I am the lead audio engineer here at Highlands. Uh, I've been on staff for 16 years this month, and I am ultimately responsible for the audio quality that leaves this campus, as well as uh, mixing in the room, do a lot of live mixing, and then I'm involved in the studio projects as well. Hey Doug, I'm Jason Colburn. I'm the broadcast audio engineer for Church of the Highlands, so I oversee our web stream, and then I'm also the project manager on the creative worship team here at the church. There are a ton of microphones on the market. I would love it if you could share some of your insights about kind of how you vetted these microphones and how you ultimately decided to start using them. Well, I take a lot of my cues from the guys that you're talking uh, to, Jason and, and Luke, and uh, their recommendations, they're on the front lines of that. So uh, what they recommend is, is gold to me. I will say that when we start talking about large live events like Christmas or Easter, you have a lot of nuance uh, and that we're in the instruments, you have a lot of nuance and the arranging, you have a lot of nuance. And, uh, and we're always looking for, you know, the microphones that are not going to skip over that, that are going to really uh, demonstrate that and, and let that shine through, um, you know, with the most intentionality possible. We put a lot of time into working on these arrangements and, uh, and we want the best representation of that as the final product and DPA uh, has has been that for us in a variety of applications. I mean, really, I just started calling friends that were in the industry that had used the DPA product line, asking, "Hey, what are your thoughts on this?" Um, I knew some other engineers at some some major churches that uh, recommended them, and then I just kind of looked around online, and it seemed like everyone was saying great things about DPA, and so we just went ahead and bought a couple. If a church was looking for their first mic in the DPA line, where would you suggest they start? I would recommend the headset mic uh, for sure. I think that uh, compared to every other headset mic out there, um, it is the most natural sounding microphone. The first microphones that we had at Grant's Mill were the 4099 small instrument microphones that have the clip-on adapter. We used those for our strings a lot. And then um, as time went on, we also moved into the headset microphones for our pastors whenever they would visit churches or have guest pastors here. Uh, so those were our two first microphones that we tried. A microphone is really akin to an instrument. Can you tell us how important finding the right microphone is to you and why? The right microphone is everything. You need a microphone that you can trust is going to deliver um, the thing that you or your team have put their heart and soul into, uh, whether that's a performance or a melody. And DPA has always been that for us. I think the fact that they are so um, true uh, between, not only within their series of microphones, but between microphone to microphone, I have presets that are specific just to, hey, I know I'm going to throw this microphone on the pastor, or I know I'm going to throw this microphone on the cello, and it's just going to work. They're flat, and therefore they are going to give you a true replication of whatever sound you're trying to pick up. So, Luke, where did you first hear about DPA mics? Going back to my touring days, um, every once in a while, I would come across a DPA vocal microphone uh, in the live environment, and they were always very true and very clean. They were one of the first uh, condenser microphones that I used in a wireless scenario in a live touring environment. And um, it was just surprising to me how, how crisp and clean and pure you could make the vocal sound compared to back in the day when all we had was 58s. Broadcast audio, you frequently don't get a second chance. What about these mics make them so good for that application? Being able to just trust the microphones because of their clarity, because of their flatness, they're, they're so true to one another, I can trust that the microphone's gonna do what it needs to do because it's going to replicate what the sound source is so accurately. Um, and I'm not going to have to work at it to try to force it to do something that it doesn't want to do. 
Capturing your Christmas extravaganza was a massive undertaking. Would love to hear your thoughts on how DPA microphones made that process an easier one. So our Christmas services last year, uh, we recorded this big orchestra and we had almost 100 inputs of only DPA microphones because of COVID and because of needing to socially distance our orchestra um, in a big convention hall downtown. Um, it, it was, um, we really had to mic them up in a non-traditional way. Uh, and so um, now we're getting ready to release those songs that we recorded as an actual album. So they'll be on uh, iTunes and Spotify and whatever else wherever else you get your music. Um, and the cool thing that I, I realized now coming back to that project months, months later, uh, is that um, DPA was the perfect choice for us because it added clarity and definition and allowed us to get uh, pick up an orchestra plus drums, plus percussion, plus live vocalists, and it just all worked together in an incredibly cohesive fashion. Awesome. Thanks again, guys, for taking the time to share your insights. Thanks, Doug. The 6066 headset is one of the most important mics we're going to cover in this video. So I'm going to use five criteria by which I judge it. And I would suggest using the same criteria when looking for a mic for your church. Right. First on the list, it's got to be comfortable. If it's not comfortable to wear your pastor or your speaker is going to be like, you know, can you just give me a handheld money wasted? Number two, it's got to sound great. And ultimately the way you tell, listen back to your live streams. That's going to give you all the feedback you need. Number three, it has to be adjustable. And that's where this headset really rocks. First of all, it adjusts in three different points on the ears. If you think about glasses, they normally sit on top of your ears. If you lean down, sometimes they will fall off. So the ability to have three points of adjustment that gently wrap around the ears means this thing's going to stay put. Also, not everybody has the same width neck. So you have the ability to adjust the frame of this thing in the back. That's huge. And then finally, there's the boom, which you can adjust how far forward and how far up and down this thing's going to sit. Ideally, you want this thing right at the edge of your smile. So here's the thing. Work with me for a second. And I like it if you could do this. We're going to do a little sound check. And I'm going to place my hand about an inch away from my mouth. And I suggest doing the same thing. And I'm going to go A-E-A-O-U, dog, duck. And if you'd be so kind as to do that with me, we're going to do something cool here. Trust me. It'll be worth it. Here we go. A-E-A-O-U, dog, duck. Now, you probably noticed that on the U and the dog and the duck, you could feel more of the breath on your hand. Those are, in microphone world, what translate into splosives, the that can be really distracting. Where you position the arm will dramatically allow you to reduce that by pulling it back. The other thing is what I call sweet nothings. Something very strange happens when you place a microphone very close to the mouth. It's kind of like when somebody's whispering in your ear and you start to hear this very fine nuanced element of the human voice that although it's part of the way we sound, we're not used to hearing those sounds on a regular basis. And if you're working with that in post, you're like, how do I get rid of it? And the answer is, you really can't. So the ability to adjust the boom is huge. All right, number four, it has to be visually inconspicuous. And the thing about these mics is that they sound great, they're super comfortable, all these other things. But again, they're not, it doesn't look like I'm, yeah, I've got the ball on the end here because it does reduce explosive, but it doesn't look like I'm going to go out and teach an aerobics class, right? You don't want people to be distracted by things like, Oh, the aerobics teachers come. It's like, you really don't want them thinking anything like that at all. All right, last but not least is termination. And that's actually a big deal. So if you just kind of got this quote unquote stock, it would come with the micro dot termination. And this is DAD 6001 adapter that obviously is belt worn. If your church has yet to buy a wireless system, or maybe, you know, you're like a satellite campus or something, this enables you to use this headset into XLR. Now, the other thing is, is that if you, are using some sort of wireless system, sometimes church change. So the ability to use the micro dot into some sort of adapter that's readily available from DPA dealers means that you can always use this headset. Again, you want to spend the money once. The other thing about this is that means that you can easily natively get into the MMAA audio interface. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, first of all, this means that your pastor can record 
a message with this headset anywhere and or just do some pre-production, which means they're comfortable with this. They are used to hearing what their voice sounds like. That's what a pre-production with a headset like this is going to be very valuable in many, many, many ways. Speaking of value, although it's not super expensive, inside the carrying case is this little mirror. And once you show people where to position this guy, it means that the pastor is always going to come out or your speaker is going to come out with this thing in the right location. And that is a big deal. Again, five out of five, this thing scores extremely well. The 4061 Lavalier is a great mic. It's super easy to use and it sounds awesome. All right, a couple of things I think you're going to want to know off the top. It's available in four different skin tones and it ships with two different grids. It's terminated in microdot there, but you can easily use one of the multitude of adapters to get into whatever wireless form factor you're looking for. This System 10 wireless has been with me to a lot of different places, NAM shows, a lot of side hustle work, uh, which gets me to some of the things that you want to be aware of in case you haven't worked a lot with lavaliers, especially Omnis. They have a tendency to be susceptible to room noise like air conditioning. So you want to be aware of that. The simple solution to that is just put up an audio bed and no one's going to know. Uh, the other thing is, again, when and where possible, uh, you want to use it in combination with a shotgun. That way you have some choices in post. Because it's Omni, if I look to the left, it'll probably get a little louder. And I look down, and it'll get a little bit louder. But because it's not cardioid, I'm not going to experience negative proximity when I look to the left. And I'm not going to get positive pro proximity when I look down. That is to say it gets bassier, which in post is a big deal. Again, I'm always thinking about what am I capturing and what have I got to do with it? Now, part of my side hustle work is with this nonprofit where everybody on staff is a woman. And when I'm going into those shoots, I'm always like, please remember no necklaces and no hanging dangly earrings because those will get picked up by this guy and you're never going to be able to get it out. And so I made that mistake once. I will not make that again. So in terms of, you know, just kind of the production, it's literally, it's a cable, it's your wireless, it's your receiver. And then usually I use some sort of Zoom handheld recorder. You know, you just want to make sure that you get good levels uh, and you want to make sure that you keep an eye on the battery. But aside from that, this is so easy to use. You cannot go wrong. The 4017B shotgun is an amazing shotgun, and that is a combination of the 4017 capsule and the B preamp. You can swap that preamp, which, by the way, terminates in XLR, out with the C preamp, which also terminates in XLR. Or, like I did in the MMA A audio interface demo, you can use something like the MMPG S or the MMPGR. S means the cable is coming out the side. R means the cable is coming out the rear. But those terminate in a micro dot. So you can use that again with the MMAA audio interface and you can capture the audio directly in your iPhone, which is super convenient. That said, the real meat and potatoes is when you use the B preamp. So first of all, the 4017 has a linear operating distance of 23.6 inches. That means if you get closer to the mic than that, or you move the mic closer to the subject, it is going to have positive proximity effect, which means you're going to get some increase in bass. Move it further away than that, you're going to get negative proximity effect, which means there's going to be a reduction in bass. And this is why the B preamp is so important. First of all, Without doing anything, you have a high pass filter at 50 hertz. Basically means all the highs above 50 hertz pass through. It also, with these rotary selectors on the B preamp there, gives the ability to engage a 4 dB boost at 8K. Again, you can select that or not, at, as well as a bass cut at 120 hertz. So that it's really how you can fine tune the way this microphone works environmentally. It is a super cardioid pattern. And the last thing I want to do before we finish this little piece here is I want you to experience the difference between an Omni mic and a cardioid. Bear with me because I think this is going to be really valuable for some of you and for the rest of you, it will be at least humorous. So what I want you to do in a moment is with me say a e a o u dog duck. So the vowel sounds are where the volume is, the g and k of dog and duck. The consonants have very little volume, but that's where we really hear the distinction of words. Then what I'm going to have you do is cup your hands, not just loosely here, but right up close like that behind your ears and do the same thing. And you're going to hear the difference between an omni mic and a super cardioid. 
Here we go. A E R O U dog duck. A E R O U dog duck. All right, it's not like you put your hands here. Literally, what you were doing was filtering this stuff out that's on the side. And that's what a super cardioid mic does. And this mic does so incredibly well. The 4097 Choir Mic, per the DPA website, is primarily made for the house of worship. And between the microphone and the components, that really bears itself out. First of all, the 4097 microphone is the identical microphone that is available as the 4097 Micro Shotgun. Also, that's the same microphone that's bundled in the 4097 Interview Kit. Great sounding microphone for the human voice, spoken and otherwise. I will spare you my vocalizations other than to say, if I were to sing, this would really demonstrate how accurate this microphone is. All right, so from the ground up, you have this floor base that is 9.4 pounds. This sucker ain't going anywhere. And even better than that, it's got this rubber diaphragm that really does a great job of eliminating stage-borne vibration from making its way up into the boom and the microphone itself. All right, this mount here is threaded. You have three vertical poles that you can screw together or... You don't have to use all three if you don't want to. I'm pretty sure this is a 3 8 inch thread, which is why I'm able to place it on my triad orbit desk. So there's some additional flexibility. All right, as you move up the pole there, you get your adapter holder there. And in this particular case, I've just kind of mounted my Audio-Technica transmitter. The transmitter, of course, is not included. The holder is. All right, this right here is what's called an active boom. And the other end is where you screw in the micro dot terminated on both ends cable that's included in this. So what's cool is this little swivel joint here is where the cable travels through for the cable management system. And in turn, that comes out here. In this particular moment, I'm utilizing the included DAD4099 micro dot to XLR adapter. Now, what's cool is it's kind of out of the gate. You can choose to either go wireless or into an XLR, and it kind of that travels with you through that adapter. That's really convenient. And the great thing is the DPA website also makes it easy to find the exact adapter that you need for your wireless transmitter. All right, getting back to this pole here, it's really interesting that, first of all, that they chose to have it terminate there. I think that's a great idea because it means that this end of the microphone is super, super clean. So if you're doing something where there's video, live stream, or anything, the form factor is great for that. And again, most importantly, this thing sounds great. So this demo is going to feature four non-body-worn dialogue microphones, each of which has been mounted to the upper shelf on my desk. So here's the thing. This classically speaks to, first of all, the breadth and depth of the line both the microphones and the accessories, but also the ability to kind of mix and match them to craft exactly what it is that you need. The other thing that I wanted to do here is give you a chance to hear how much alike these microphones are. All right, this demo is going to do a couple of other things. Microphone number one and number two are running into the MMAA audio interface, and that in turn is running into my iPhone. I'm utilizing the MMA app. That's a free iOS app that allows me to separate those signals left and right if I want to. I could also add a high pass filter on each of those, but I'm not. That in turn is going out into good old simple voice memos. Once that's recorded, I'm going to send that via Bluetooth to the BT Pro from radial, and that's going to go into my universal audio audio interface. Technically, you're hearing two audio interfaces, but both of them are so transparent, nobody would be able to tell the difference, in my opinion, of whether you're hearing the MMA into the UA audio interface or not. All right, so microphone number one. The 4097 Micro Shotgun. Microphone number two is the 4015 capsule into the MMPGS active cable, which is basically a preamp. And the S is saying that there's a little cable coming out the side. That's the S. All right. Microphone number three is the 4017B Shotgun. That's running directly into my UA interface. And microphone number four is technically the same as microphone number one. It's the microphone from the 4097 interview kit that I've mounted. This is a trick that I learned from Paul at DPA to one of the drum mounts that DPA has. Very, very cool. Again, it's just sitting up there on one of the shelves on my desk. So here's the deal. That in turn normally terminates out into a microdot. But what I've got is I've got the DAD 4099 microdot to XLR adapter, which has a built-in 
high pass filter, which I think it is at 50 hertz. So it just kind of eliminates any of the rumbly stuff that you would never want in on your dialogue anyway. All right, now in terms of the demo, this is something I learned from Bo at DPA. We're going to do vowel sounds, and then we're going to do words with consonants at the end. Vowels are where the volume come from, A, E, A, O, U. I'm going to use U instead of U because U is a diphthong with Y and U. And for the consonant side, we're going to use the words dog and duck. Why? For somebody who swallows their consonants, dog and duck sound a lot like dog and duck. So when you're testing dialogue, this is a great approach to test dialogue. All right, so you'll see which microphone I'm on as I'm doing it. Here we go. A, E, A, O, U. Dog, duck. 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 There you have it. This following content was something the good folks at DPA allowed me to repurpose to tell you more about this microphone since you probably didn't want to hear me singing through it. Yes, you can also use it for stuff like announcements, so on and so forth, but this really is primarily a vocal microphone. To hear Kim using it, down below in the show notes is a link back to the companion story for this video. Protect your investment in fantastic sound. A microphone is no better than its capsule, and there are no better handheld mic capsules than de facto capsules. The two vocal capsules are made to capture electrifying stage performances. The de facto linear vocal capsule has an extremely linear frequency response. The de facto vocal capsule has a high-end boost. And the interview capsule is the optimal choice for studio or field broadcasting and ENG. With the de facto line, you are no longer bound to one wireless solution. If circumstances change, you can just switch your adapter at a quarter of the cost of a new microphone. De facto adapters work with all leading wireless mic solutions, both established brands as well as up-and-comers. So it is easy to upgrade your system without downgrading your sound. De facto gives you three-stage pop protection in a grid finish of your choice, black, nickel, or gold. Learn about the full range of de facto microphones and accessories at dpamicrophones.com. The 2011C, or in this particular case, a pair of them, great for capturing the essence of what I love about worship guitar. On one hand, it's kind of this wash of delay and reverb, but on the other hand, you can really hear the separation of the layers when you have clarity. Great thing about these mics, that's what they excel in. All right, Signal Chain, Gretsch, MXR Dynacomp Deluxe. I am not using my little green wonder. That's a mad professor pedal, of course. I am using a dotted eighth and quarter note delay in the Eventide H9 and a stereo reverb in the Revelation reverb from Jet. I'm coming out of that into a pair of radial SGIs into my AC30s, two of them, that are sequestered behind closed doors in my amp closet that may be like some sort of amp room you've got at your church. The linear operating distance on the 2011s is 11.8 inches, but I've actually got each one of them about an inch away from the speaker grill. Because the uh, pattern on these guys is just a traditional cardioid, there will be some bass buildup from the proximity effect, but nothing that was particularly extreme. The thing that was extreme was the fact that I could just point them right smack at the center of the dust cap which is something I would never do with most microphones. Just It would just be that spike in the ear. It's like, whoa. But right smack in the center, I just kind of went, ah, try it about there. Turn the amps up, close the doors, came out here and just kind of fine-tuned the sound with my pedals. And you're about to hear what the end result was. I absolutely love it. Although a lot of churches don't mic up bass amps, if you have the freedom to be able to do so, it adds a whole level of detail and body that's great front of house and especially for the bass player. So in a second, we're going to hear the 4011A, which earlier I mentioned is the same mic that Sting uses in the studio 
for his vocals. That's pretty awesome. So the thing is, is that Paul Andrews at DPA shared a term with me that he calls linear operating distance. And that's basically describing how far the mic needs to be from the sound source that if you move it closer, it exhibits positive proximity effect, which is to say it gets bassier. And as you pull it away, it gets less bassy. And so the cardioid pattern on this microphone just did a great job of picking up the tweeter in my bass amp as well as the speaker. And so I had it basically 12 inches away, about halfway in between the tweeter and the woofer. And it just captured the experience of what it was like for me to play through the amp in the moment, which for me is awesome. Let's take a listen. The 4015A is a very special microphone. And in this demo, I was able to do something I've never been able to do before. Accurately capture the sound of the guitar amp in the room as it actually sounds in the room. And that was dependent on the fact, first of all, it's a super clear microphone, very transparent, but it's got a wide cardioid pattern, which means it doesn't just hear the sound source directly in front of it, it's picking up the environment as well. And the other thing is it has a linear operating distance of 23.6 inches. In this particular case, I actually placed it about 12 inches away from the amp, pointed straight at the center of the dust cap, and it just captured everything perfectly. Uh, also, the A preamp's got a little switch inside where you can add a 20 dB cut if you need to. I didn't, but that's great in case you've got some super loud sound source, you just need to back that off. The other thing is, this is the microphone that I kind of discovered, wow, the best way to learn the sonic signature of a microphone is to record my spoken voice into it because I know my voice so well, I'm like, oh, this is what this microphone sounds like. And in the process, I discovered this is also an amazing dialogue microphone. And that's what you're hearing me through right now. That said, let's get to the guitar demo. <laughs> The 4099 is the workhorse of the DPA line, and it kind of embodies everything this line is about. It's easy to adjust, it's tiny, and it sounds great on a ton of different instruments per the diagram that you're looking at. It comes in two different variations, loud SPL and extreme SPL, the latter of which is designed to be used on trumpets and things like drums. In a moment, you're gonna hear it used on this guitar, and it's perfect for churches where you have people who show up with instruments that don't have a pickup like a mandolin or a violin or some acoustic guitars. This is not my most expensive instrument, nor is it my least expensive, which is why it's perfect for this demo. As much as I love the fact that my iPhone shoots 4K video, the audio is subpar, at least the onboard audio. And this is one of the places that the MMAA audio interface really shines. So here I am, obviously in my minivan. I love it when pastors give those heartfelt talks to their team or sometimes share stuff on social media. Again, we've got 4K video on the phone, but the audio, eh. So what's happening here is you're hearing me through the 4097 micro shotgun plugged directly into the MMAA, and that's stashed up in the visor of the passenger seat headset. Now what you're hearing is you're actually hearing the 4017 shotgun into the MMPGS preamp also running into the MMA. So what's really cool is, is that little baby preamp about the size of a tea cookie has two inputs and it comes with a free bundled app, iOS only, sorry about that, if you're an Android user. But what's neat is it allows you to really set the level of each of those microphones. And one of the other things that's really cool about it is I can either record the audio in quote unquote stereo, or I can record it into dual mono. So now what you're gonna hear is the 4097 over here and the 4017 over here. So here is the 4097 and here is the 4017. Those two mics sound very, very similar to one another. The fact that I can bring the 4017 shotgun 
with that little baby preamp on the backside and connect that to the MMA speaks to the versatility of the product line and the fact that I can capture high fidelity audio anywhere, including my minivan. So one of the reasons I created the timeline links down below is in theory, you should probably just have to watch through this section one time. But I also wanted to make sure that if you were so inclined, you could share this with team members because this is really important in terms of making sure you make the right purchase in the right order because we're going to identify the common problems, which is probably the best way to look at the first places you should choose to spend your money addressing the problems in terms of the order of what's the most problematic. And then the other side of it is, again, once you spend that money, you want to make sure that you're not kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you're doing some of the things that are sabotaging getting the most out of them. All right. In the main intro, I mentioned the idea of not having to fuss with a microphone. That is separate from the concept of actually treating a microphone as you would in a traditional production fashion. For example, on a lead vocal, I'm going to put a high pass filter on that. I don't need to hear a bunch of stuff on the bottom end that really is not going to add any clarity to the vocals, which gets us to the number one offender in handheld microphones, lack of clarity. So I used to be the worship and creative arts director at a small slash medium sized church, probably about the size of your church. And before I took that role, there were some microphones that were purchased from a major manufacturer, but they were kind of the mid-level microphones. They sounded terrible. They sounded terrible for the vocalists in their in-ears. When we used wedges for kind of quote-unquote acoustic worship, they sounded terrible. They sounded terrible front of house. And guess what? Online, they didn't get any better. Clarity, clarity, clarity. Bruce Adolph, the publisher of Worship Musician, and I were at a meeting with the world's largest sound reinforcement company. And one of the things that they said is churches have a tendency to buy the PA, the same PA, three times over. Spend money right the first time and you won't regret it the second and third times. So here's the thing. Separate from clarity with your vocal mic is this other thing of dynamic range. How many of you seen, <laughs> and it's a loaded question, the person doing the announcements where they feel they have to hold the microphone down at their belly? High dynamic range means that you can get the microphone away from the sound source and bring the level back up before you get feedback. And that is kind of coupled with the fact that DPA microphones in particular have excellent off axis. That is to say, if the microphone's pointing this way, stuff that's over here, off axis rejection it doesn't listen to that stuff. Super, super important. The idea of being able to combat something like that with the announcement microphones, we see it week in, week out. It's not going away. All right, that gets us to actual feedback. One of my favorite acoustic instruments, especially for kind of acoustic style worship, is the cajon. It sounds and feels like a drum set, but it has this wonderful organic flavor. Many of us are doing worship in some sort of high school slash junior high school gymnasium. We're up on the stage that after we're done, all the chairs get stacked up and get put in underneath the stage. So that stage is really like, a big giant drum, it's hollow inside and sound reverberates. So when the band starts playing and all that reverberation starts to happen, quite often that mic that's used to mic the cajon all of a sudden starts feeding back. Separate from the fact that it may not even actually reproduce the sound of the cajon accurately. If you've used a cajon and tried to get it up to volume, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's usually this kind of low rumbly feedback that as soon as you get it to volume, it just feeds back. That gets us to another feedback that just is, is heartbreaking. I love a choir. Traditionally, those of us have choirs once a month, right? So again, if you're in some sort of rented gymnasium, that choir boom stand is sitting there on that elevated, if you will, giant snare drum because it's sound reverberating around the inside that sound is. And what's happening as soon as the bass starts playing and the drummer starts playing and the kick drums going on one, three and, and the bass player is doing eighth notes, that stand starts to vibrate. And by the time you get the level up to the point where you can actually hear the choir, you start getting feedback. It's heartbreaking. I've been both on the stage side and the front of house side of that equation, and it's a real drag. Uh, when we get to the uh, DPA 4097 choir microphone, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff they do with that, but they've really gone out of the way to make sure that thing doesn't go to feedback which gets us to my last point, which is the most tragic. 
the pastor with the headset that is craning off into outer space because it doesn't sit in the right place. The poor sound tech is back there at this board trying to adjust input level, riding the fader. Of course, everybody's turning around, giving them a nasty look as if it's their fault. And they're like, again, thank you. All right. So (laughs) those are the common problems. Whichever one of those is most painful for you is probably the place you want to start thinking about fixing and finding the right solution. A DPA is great about this, both with the microphones and the accessories, because being able to place the right microphone in the right place, again, the pastor with the cranny headset being the perfect example, uh, that's kind of the job. All right, speaking of the job, there are a couple of things that worship teams and a couple of things that sound techs do that kind of sabotage the whole point of having great microphones. It would be unfair to totally throw the worship team under the bus without kind of actually including the the sound tech side of it. Snare drum is the number one culprit of a bad online mix. I'm going to say that one more time. The snare drum is the number one culprit of a bad online mix. Why is that? Well, if you think about the snare drum, it's one, two, three, four. Twice a measure, that thing is being hit with incredible amounts of passion. Usually that's entirely too loud for whatever environment we're in. The sound tech part of this is that there are many sound techs that really love drums and often mix the drums hotter than they actually should be, especially the snare drum. And what happens is that snare drum cracking on two and four and in the build before the chorus basically takes all the clarity out of the lead vocal, the thing that is, in my opinion, the most important thing happening during worship. So get drummers some smaller sticks, have a heartfelt conversation with them. And if you listen to your online mixes and kind of go, yeah, the snare drum is really loud. And you also know the same thing when we're kind of back in our venues. are like, yeah, the snare drum's too loud. Again, what happens is if the snare drum is too loud in the room, acoustically speaking, the sound tech will turn it down on the fader. The problem is that means that now, potentially your online mix, the snare drum's actually too quiet. So it's this kind of catch-22 situation. It's a problem, but if we don't talk about it, we're not able to solve it. All right, the last one... Um, I'm going to call out the uh, the vocalists. They're famous for not having the click up on their in-ears if you're using a click. I get that it's not a super pleasing sound a lot of the time, but what ends up happening, let's just say below, we'll use 100 BPM as an example, is I automatically can look around the platform and I know which vocalists are listening to the click and aren't because as soon as we get to some sort of breakdown where the drums aren't hitting two and four, they immediately start to drag. Now, the real drag of this is, is the poor sound tech who in that moment should be riding some VCF kind of with, you know, this beautiful, lovely reverb, this ethereal sound that starts to come up. Instead, they're kind of having to choose, all right, which one of my vocalists is most in tune and which one of them is in time? This one? No, 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 now this one, now this one. And so they're spending all their focus here instead of going, I've got a great blend. Let me bring in some of that reverb. That is the difference between creative mixing and corrective mixing. Worship teams, we have a responsibility to make sure that our tech teams can make the most out of the gear that we've invested people's ties into purchasing. All right. With that said, let's get to the rest of the content. And hopefully that will be valuable for you, both in terms of the microphones you choose and also solving some of the problems that you have that are recurring. Awesome. One of the most important things I can share with you is a strategy on determining which microphones you should buy first. Pretty easy, actually, when you think about the fact that most churches encounter the same types of microphone-borne failures over and over, quite often on a weekly basis. So what are those? Number one, when you're listening to your live stream, do the lead vocals sound murky? And if so, it's probably the microphone. So here's the thing. In years past, I was the worship and creative arts director at a medium-sized church perhaps about the same size as your church. Before I stepped into that role, somebody had bought some mid-price point microphones from a really well-known company. They sounded terrible. They were murky in the in-ears when we did quote-unquote acoustic worship nights. They were murky in the wedges. They were murky in the mains. And guess what? It didn't get any better online. So if you use your online mixes as an example, you find that your vocals aren't clear, chances are it's the handheld microphones. Speaking of handheld microphones, let's get to announcements and those folks that decide they've just got to hold the microphone down there. 
you know what I'm talking about. So the de facto mics, handhelds, also known as the 4018, usually either come with a 4018 VL or a 4018 V capsule, which generally sits, the linear operating distance is about four to five inches. The great thing is you can actually replace a capsule in there with the regular 4018 capsule that extends that linear operating distance to about 12 inches. So the point being is instead of here, if you want to have somebody make announcements from down here, we got it dialed. That's a big deal because it's something that happens week in and week out, no matter how many times you tell people. All right. Last, but in no way least, is the pasture with the craning headset. That boom is craning in outer space. The poor sound tech is frantically trying to adjust input gain and riding the fader, sweating bullets. And of course, everybody's turning around, giving them nasty looks because they can't hear the pastor. So here's the thing. DPA's headsets are great in terms of the way they grip the ear and how you can adjust them. And in turn, how you can adjust the boom on the actual headset itself so you can get that microphone to be placed in the optimal position, have great sound, and not go anywhere. All right, moving on. I would be remiss if I didn't point out the common worship and tech team fails to preclude churches from getting most out of the investment that they make in microphones. So we're going to start off with the much beloved techs. So here's the thing. Many front of house techs over mixed drums. And so the end result is you got a drummer in the back of the platform slash stage passionately beating the daylights out of the snare drum. Separate conversation. You got somebody front of house who goes, that sounds awesome. I'm going to even bring that up more in the, in the front of house mix. And all of a sudden it's snare, 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 twice a measure and even more in fills. And that is directly pushing the clarity and legibility of the vocals out of the way. So here's the thing is you're going to probably be able to tell a couple of unique things by listening to your live stream mixes. One is if the snare drum is too quiet, that's a sign of the fact that it was probably too loud in the room. Or two, if it's boomingly loud, it hints that maybe your front of house mixer just likes snare, maybe just a tad bit more than is appropriate for your online mixes. Again, these are all heartfelt conversations. All right, there's another giant warship team fail that happens, separate from the drummer beating the daylights out of that snare drum, which is vocalists that do not listen to the click. Now, why is that? When we get to a song that's a I don't know, 100 BPM or slower, and it gets to a spot where any type of drums or percussion drop out, i.e. maybe the beginning of the song, I can spot them a mile away, the vocalists that are just dragging in the time because they're not listening to the click. So what ends up happening is the poor front of house tech is kind of going, wait a second, uh, which one's more in tune? No, no, which one's more in time? No, that one's out of tune, that one's out of time. They are doing what's called corrective mixing as opposed to, riding some beautiful stereo bus with this luxurious reverb that's taking worship through the roof, that's creative mixing. When the vocalists are not doing their part, which is not only about getting a great blend, not only about singing in tune, but it is about singing in time, it prevents the front of house engineer from doing their job. So what it means is all the things that they could be doing to put polish on each section of the song They're just chasing faders instead of getting into that creative zone. It happens every week. And it's one of the things that doesn't get talked about. And honestly, if you want to make the most out of the investment you made of that microphone you put in their hand, it's an important conversation to have because it happens week in and week out. We love our people, but we want to make sure that we make the most of the investment that people through their ties allow us to do in terms of purchasing gear. On behalf of everyone at Worship Musician Magazine, Thanks so much for checking out this video. For more information on DPA mics, as well as a ton of information on using mics in general, please visit dpamicrophones.com. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Worship Musician channel, I want to invite you to do so. And please don't forget to ring the bell so we can let you know when more videos are going to go online. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching. God bless.